All right, everyone. Yat a she Michelle Curtis Yanishia, who was Lena Nishle, Mat Dishkishni Bashishin, touching me Dishu, Nale Tatnazani Dishu Che. My name is Michelle Curtis. I am the Sex Trafficking Project Coordinator with the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. Um, please bear with me. I am getting over a cold, so I'm getting my voice back. But uh, we're going to start our training. I'm happy that you're all here today and, you know, to hear from our wonderful presenters and, and to also um, participate with us in our workshop this afternoon. So we're going to start our agenda and I'd like to introduce a Navajo Nation Council Delegate Amber Crotty and she's going to open us with a prayer. It's good to see you. I know with in our weather here it's been very windy um, but I just want to have a gentle reminder for everyone that in our teachings, um, you know, you let the nature, you let mother nature do her thing. So when it's windy and the pollen is moving through the air, the dust is moving through the air. One thing we had prayed for during COVID was that this virus be moved up into the atmosphere so it can dissipate. And so this might be the time where our mother is cleaning house, right? Making sure that all of us, um, push that negative energy, push that, um, you know, remind us to keep our homesteads clean and and just stay connected. So I, I just wanna continue and in this prayer, we'll, we'll pray for healing for all of us um, as you struggle with your respiratory um, or your sniffles, your allergies, um, just, you know, go back to those uh, herbs, drink your tea, um, put your sage down, inhale that smoke, clear out your system because your system is also passing that negative energy out. Um, so you might hear my little dogs in the background. Uh, so I apologize, but that's just the way it is. So we'll just come together in um, prayer. We'll come together in your own way. Um, this morning we offered white corn to the sunrise. And um, so I'll continue with that prayer kind of our mid-morning uh, check-in with, with our mother here. So, this morning we pulled out our pollen to just, and our taradin to just give offering to that sunrise, to know that as the colors changed from that dark blue to that light blue and seeing that little ray of, of sunlight that you restored us, that we went through a complete cycle yesterday, and that today you're giving us the strength and the understanding that we need to move forward in the most positive way. When we gave that offering and connected each other through that line and gave offering through that horizon, we recognized not only the change in the season, the change of the day, but the change within ourselves. Yesterday we learned from days past, we continue to learn. We go to our elders who you continue to strengthen to give us that integrity, give us that wisdom on how they not only survived but have thrived and that our footsteps that are across our mother earth that we continue to nourish and look at our shadow and provide those, those healing words that we need for ourselves, for our elders, for our veterans to know that during this time of isolation and as we come together and reconnect, that our feelings and our hurt will also be exposed. So give us that strength, give us that armor from the tips of our toes all the way up to the tip of our head. Protect us with those warrior teachings, protect us and give us the tools that we need to combat these this negative energy out there, but don't, Holy ones, don't have us keep it. Take it away from us with the wind, with the smoke, with our breath. Take all that negative energy and our breath continue the, the healing vibrations of the world. We're going to talk about our missing relatives. We're going to talk about the hurt in our communities. Guard us, protect our heart, keep our backs strong 
but then allow us to release that energy, allow us for that healing, allow us for our minds also to be restored, allow us for our bodies to be restored, allow us to continue to pray into the seeds. And as we plant and as they grow fruitful, that we whisper these powerful healing words and that we continue to nurture our plants as we nurture ourselves, as we continue to look to our livestock for their little hoofs in the ground that collect that little bit of water that sustains us so that we remember little acts that we do collectively can create that healing space. That what we're doing here and learning and coming together and gathering is a healing space. And that we ask from all of the four directions, all of the mountains to continue to protect us from Sisna Jinnisotsit, Tokoslint, the Benetsa, Sisna Aldisli We ask that you continue to not only protect us here in our mountains, but for all of our relatives that are extended through our clan relations, all of our relatives that are five finger people, all of our relatives that are children of this mother earth, that we come together and that we continue to give our offerings and remember that we are the essence of you, our, our mother. We are the essence of you, our father. And as we heal, we call for those relatives, for their strength and their mind to never give up, to know that we're praying for their return. to ask for any of our five finger relatives who know what happened, to call them back that they're wanted. We're calling them back home and that for our animals, our four-legged, our insects, our birds, who's ever seen our relatives, call them back. Give us, give us that energy through your connection as the trees connect on the mountain with the herbs, as they connect with the birds. We want our relatives to come back home. Their children are crying for them. Their parents are crying for them. Their community is crying for them. We cannot be whole until we have them returned. We need them to come back. Give them that mental strength, not only for everyone on this training, but for our relatives who are missing and for those individuals who have taken them violently, to give them the compassion that they need to return them, that they are loved, that they are cherished, and that their family wants them home. So we just say this in the most beautiful way and we ask in all four directions and from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, we say this in the most, the most humble way, uh, Holy Ones to continue to guide us and to provide us and give us that strength to continue to fight for our loved ones. Thank you Shabeja and everyone on the call have a beautiful day, and we just appreciate the energy that you're bringing to this training. So next on our agenda, we have Honey Sunday, who's going to go over housekeeping. All right, um, housekeeping items. Please rename yourself on Zoom or send your full name to me, Honey Sunday, so we can record and mark you for being present for attendance. And please use the chat box for questions or comments. And we will establish a community agreement for respectful dialogue. Feel free to use the Zoom reactions and the raise hand function. CSVNW staff will be on standby if you have any questions. If Zoom happens to log you off, wait for a minute. If it does not come back up, use the link that we sent you all to sign back on. And we apologize ahead of time. <laughs> Um, health for tips, we encourage you to take care of yourself and utilize these recommended tips because some of the topics that we will be like discussing is going to be, um, very, um, discomforting, but here are some helpful tips. Have grounding tools nearby, Play-Doh, stress ball, fidget spinners, use headphones if needed, um, choose a place where, with a stable internet connection to learn from, keep water and healthy snacks nearby. Be gentle with yourself and take breaks as needed and engage in breathing exercises. For example, we have one up, breathing in for four seconds and holding it for four seconds and then breathing out for four seconds and repeating it as needed. All right, so next on our agenda today, um, I will be presenting on how gender-based violence is connected to MMAWR. So 
So, with the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women, we do serve all of New Mexico, and this includes Isleta del Sur, and then, um, let's see, and then part of um, Texas, which is located in El Paso. So we are a member-driven coalition. So we have different organizations who are members. And if you're interested on becoming a member, you can go on our website and get more information on that. <clears throat> so we have four main focus areas with our coalition. And with that, it's training, technical assistance, policy advocacy, and support. So the demographics and statistics in New Mexico, there are nearly 229,000 American Indian and Alaska Natives who live here in the state of New Mexico. 23 tribal nations, 19 Pueblos, three Apache tribes, and the Navajo Nation, which spans into New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona. So with that, it's more the four corner region. And tribal nations, it makes up 11% of the population in New Mexico. So about 55,000 American Indian and Alaska Natives currently live in just Albuquerque, the metro area alone. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about statistics and data on violence against Native women. <clears throat> so 84% of Native women or four and five have experienced violence in their lifetime. 56% of Native women have experienced sexual violence. And then 55.5% have been physically hurt by an intimate partner. So overall, it's more than half <clears throat> of the percentage that Native women have experienced violence. So sexual violence in tribal communities. Here it states that over 60% of crimes in New Mexico uh, in tribal communities is sexual violence. So one in three Native women have experienced some form of sexual assault. <clears throat> in New Mexico, 88% of Native survivors reported that their offender was also Native. Native women are 2.5 uh, times more likely to experience rape than other women in the nation. <clears throat> Missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, trans, and two-spirit are at a high percentage with sexual assault also. So <clears throat> here it's overall more than 1.5 million Native women have experienced violence in their lifetime. So, you know, this contributes, it's a huge factor that contributes to the MMIWR. <clears throat> and then here, we're gonna go into violence against the LGBTQ2S relatives. <clears throat> so, with the data that's collected, you know, when it comes to the community of the LGBTQ2 spirit, it's often um, hard to get that data and they're underrepresented. Re represented. So we need to acknowledge that violence is happening to our LGBTQ2 spirit relatives. And with that, I wanted to read this quote by Lenny Hayes. So while there is no accurate data that represents the rates of domestic and sexual violence that occurs within two-spirit native LGBTQ community, it occurs all the same. Unfortunately, this lack of data creates the false ideal that domestic violence and sexual violence are not experienced within this community. So domestic <clears throat> and sexual violence, they, um, it doesn't discriminate. The, the relatives were highly honored in Native society. So before colonization, 
with our LGBTQ relatives, you know, they were looked at as important people in their community. They were caregivers, caretakers. They um, were often like looked at as medicine people. So um, once colonization came <clears throat> and assimilated our native relatives, it changed the whole um, that the outlook of our LGBTQ relatives. So with that, um, violence against our transgender, queer, and two-spirit relatives is not traditional. Like I said, before colonization, uh, they were um, honored people in the community. So with that, you know, the violence, it's not in any of our tradition to um, <clears throat> discriminate against them. Uh, let's see, DV tactics can be similar to heterosexual relationships. However, there are exceptions. Oops, sorry. So some examples of <clears throat> DV tactics that are used against our LGBTQ2 spirit relatives is outing someone. So by outing someone, it means telling others the victim's gender identity or sex, sexuality without their consent. Also, the abusing partner may out the victim, which can place them in more danger. And it can increase their likelihood of additional violence from others. So 40% of lesbian women and 61% of bisexual women compared to 35% of heterosexual women experience rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. 25% of gay men and 37% of bisexual men compared to 29% of heterosexual men experience rape, physical violence, and stalking by an intimate partner at some point in their lifetime. And this comes from uh, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. So like I um, mentioned before, our LGBTQ relatives, they hold an honorable, mean, meaningful places in our community and they deserve to feel safe, loved and respected like anyone else. So uh, for being a direct service provider and an advocate, it's important for us to be a good relative uh, <clears throat> and being inclusive in all our spaces. Uh, you can honor our LGBTQ two-spirit relatives by asking for their pronouns, using all gender neutral terms for survivors instead of just the word she. So <clears throat> how many of you have seen this picture before? And if you have, you can um, go off mute and uh, tell me what you know about this picture or you can go in the chat box. Yeah, is anyone raising their hand? I can't um, see you because I'm sharing my screen. Their hand, but we have a lot of um, comments. Laura Baker says, yeah, Jasmine Costellas has never saw this. Agnes says, white savior, Jessica Burks, manifest destiny. Christine Means, the manifest destiny. Beverly Guest, KH, Marquita, manifest destiny. Preston says, I'm not familiar, but yeah, I agree with other, with the other posters. Gen, Gen C Gen, says manifest destiny and Tiffany correct manifest destiny. Yes. So with this picture here, it is um, represents the manifest destiny. So it um, depicts westward expansion, which was in the 19th century settler colonial doctrine that was an expansion of the U.S. throughout the American. Um, continents was both justified and, and uh, sorry. <laughs> so with that, you know, we're going to go into the history of colonization and we're going to talk about uh, the impacts of it and, you know, 
how we know that settler colonism um, <clears throat> were a huge factor in <clears throat> colonialism. Oops. So colonization and violence, <clears throat> its impacts of the of colonization, so which that includes murder, genocide, and pa patriarchy. Uh, settler colonism, systematic racism, institutional and structural <clears throat> uh, violence against Native women, which goes into sex trafficking, murder, femicide, and forced sterilization. And then colonization equals genocide. So we're going to go into how that was the first power and control model um, on a massive scale. So I don't know if many of you heard of the power and control model, but you know this is where it stems from is colonization. Uh, <clears throat> all these impacts are what we know as settler colonialism. So with this, indigenous people are erased through through outright genocide, assimilation, and interbreeding, including rape. In this process, it's created in different categories that became important for perpetrating the system. So with that, another important concept is understanding the system is an ideal that in settler, settler colon, sorry, colonialism is invasion is a structure, not an event. So with that, this means that settler colon, colonialism is not just <clears throat> vicious thing um, of the past, such as the gold rush, but exist as long as the settlers are living on appropriated land and that it still exists today. So <clears throat> we're gonna go into systematic racism, which is in institutional and structural. So with institutional racism, it's a systematic distribution of resources, power, and opportunity in our society to the benefit of the people who are white and excludes of um, people of colors. So with that, we're going to look at wealth gap food insecurity, housing insecurity, lack of environment, environmental justice, and high incarceration rates. So institutional racism, it's, you know, as you see, like extractive industry coming into tribal lands and, you know, violating our lands and <clears throat> taking our resources. So you don't see any benefits that <clears throat> native people will get from that. You know, we still are in poverty and um, also like the extractive industry, they come in and, you know, they put harsh chemicals into our water system and continue to pepper, um, perpetuate the violence using our, the land in that way. <clears throat> so when we look at structural uh, violence and racism, it's a system of hierarchy and inequity. So this is characterized by white supremacy. Um, so it's the preferential treatment, privilege and power for white people at the expense of our um, Black Indigenous people of color, public policy and practices that historically work against Black and Indigenous people. So when you think of that, you um, can look back and think of the Jim Crow laws. You can look at boarding schools, <clears throat> the reservation. So, you know, they're trying to uh, assimilate you know, people of color and um, trying to get rid of the Indian problem. So this all um, adds up to the violence against Native women. So we're going to go into gender-based violence. 
The term gender violence reflects the ideal that violence often serves to maintain structural gender inequalities. This includes all types of violence against women, transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming relatives. Patriarchy, a system of society or government in which men hold power and women are largely excluded from it. Women and children treated as Chatelain experienced many forms of abuse. So historically, several Native societies were matriarchal and honored their women, children, and indigenous queer transgender relatives to spirit relatives. So the introduction of patriarchy and the systems of whole power of white <clears throat> land-owning males. So let's see, how many of you heard the word patriarchy? And what comes to mind? You can put it in the chat box or you can take yourself off mute. <clears throat> Caroline Peterson says power. Rita Martinez says power concentrated in a few. Diane Sandoval, Gregor, men make the decisions. Tim, power and control caste system. Gen, Gen, C, Gen C male power. Preston says with patriarchy, I think about how men set the agenda. Gladys Godoy, men in power and using it for control. Michelle Ben, control of the minority masses, indigenous peoples. Yes, thank you. So it is a term that emphasizes the discrimination of women, trans, queer, and non-binary folks, also victimized by the same sex as social principle. So that goes into heteropatriarchy, which is a socio-political system where Primarily, cisgender males and hetero folks have authority over cisgender females, folks or varying gender identities and non-heterosexual orientations. So it's commonly understood that men generally occupy the highest position of power in society, causing women and non-binary people to experience the bulk of social and systematic oppression. So <clears throat> gender norms serve to set social expectations associated with masculinity and femininity and a binary system. <clears throat> so when we talk about the binary system, uh, this binary system, it doesn't align with cultural or traditional ways of life of several native nations. So Western society is barely catching on to these um, concepts that have existed long before colonization. And with that, in our um, traditional way of life, especially within our native nations, we honor all identities, especially in tribal communities. So like what I mentioned before, uh, before colonization, um, our LGBTQ relatives, they were honored and um, very, you know, they were dependable and caregivers in our tribal community. So our, the binary system today, it just doesn't align with our, our cultural and traditional ways before colonization. The history of sexual violence and genocide of Native women illustrates how gender violence fu functions as a tool for racism and colonialism. Native women have often been the primary focus of sexual violence because of their ability to give birth. This type of violence in some way influenced or is influenced by gender relations. <laughs> so Native women often, you know, they're always the focus of sexual violence because of their ability to give birth. So, with gender-based violence, <clears throat> you know, our bodies were viewed as dirty, rapeable, and disposable. So when you look at like the history of Andrew Jackson, he systematically killed women and children. And then another tactic, um, a colonizer tactic is interbreeding. And then, um, of course, then it goes into sterilization of women. So toxic masculinity, it promotes stereotypes of men as socially dominant along with related traits such as 
um, homophobic, transphobic behavior, and it's considered toxic due to part of the promotion of violence, domestic violence, rape culture, and sexual violence. <coughs> Okay, so this type of violence in some way influence or is influenced by gender relations. Uh, it promotes the traditional stereotypes of men as socially dominant, along with related traits such as homophobic, transphobic behavior, and it's a promotion of violence, domestic violence, rape, and sexual violence. Uh, this socialization of young boys often normalize violence. You know, have you heard boys will be boys? That saying, you know, like, oh, um, he's being mean to you because he likes you. So the, those are the things we hear. And this just engages in aggressive or bullying behaviors. So to adequately address this violence, and cultural and societal issues um, that encourages violence as part of masculinity <clears throat> need to be eradicated. So how can we do this? How can we get away from normalizing violence? So with that, it's just, you know, just talking. It starts with our families. So, you know, having those conversations, letting our children know that you know this is not healthy and um, especially our sons sons brothers like making sure that they are of aware they're aware that this is toxic masculinity <coughs> so with that to balance that conversation we also need to to be having the conversations like i said to heal our male relatives so that's very important so it starts from our homes to you know have those hard conversations and and to recognize um, what is violence and how to um i guess be the role model in our in our families so here uh here's a quote uh cheyenne proverb a nation is not <clears throat> conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground. Then it's finished, no matter how brave it, its warriors or how strong their weapons. So with that, um, this shows that we're women are resilient and we're strong. And we shouldn't forget that. So Native women and trans queer relatives are carrying this work and we should be very proud. Now we're gonna go into what is domestic violence? So what is domestic violence? Domestic violence is one or multiple types of abuse, such as physical, emotional, verbal, sexual, financial, cultural, spiritual, or digital abuse aimed at a relative. So uh, examples, son to mother, brother to sister, granddaughter to grandfather, roommate to roommate. <clears throat> intimate partner violence is a form of domestic violence that happens when a current or a former spouse or intimate partner engages in a repetitive fear-inducing pattern of abuse toward their partner to maintain, maintain power and control in the relationship. So this pattern of abuse can take place in relationships where couples are dating, married, living together, have a child together, or after the relationship has ended. The vast majority of victims of intimate partner violence are women with primarily male offenders. So here we have the power and control triangle. And I'm pretty sure many of you have seen the, the circle, the power control wheel, but we like to use the triangle. And this is from the National Indigenous Women Resource Center. So with this power and control triangle, uh, this is a, an unnatural phenomenon, which is characterized by a pattern of action that an individual uses to intentionally control or dominate their intimate partner. 
So when you look at the triangle, you have sexual violence and then physical violence. And unnatural. So with that, you know, in the triangle, it's you see your ritual abuse, cultural abuse, coercion and threats, economic abuse, and it goes up to the top, which is male privilege. <coughs> So a batterer systematically uses threats, intimidation, and coercion to instill fear into their partner. So the culture and traditional life of many tribes, you know, when you see this, you think of, like, like I said, the power and control will. So that um with like native american cultural culture the wheel represents like a circle of life so you know beginning of life to ending of life and that doesn't that's not appropriate explaining power and control so that's why we use this um <clears throat> triangle so other types of abuse we have neglect Purposely neglecting partner, household member who maybe depend on the abuser for physical assistance. Affected persons, elders, disabled persons, mentally disabled, nonverbal persons, and children. And then there's digital abuse. Utilizing electronics to control or bully victims. So this is like, you know, when... Someone is checking their partner's phone, checking their social media, posting, harassing information, or sharing intimate communication. Then stalking. Oops. Um, so it's a conduct directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. Unlike, unlike other crimes that involves a single incident, stalking is a pattern of behavior it is often made up of individual acts that could by themselves seem harmless or non-criminal. And then here we're going to the equality wheel. Again, this is from the National Indigenous Women Resource Center. <coughs> so the work to end violence against native women and recreate peaceful and harmonious communities is based on reclaiming our traditional values, belief system and life ways. <clears throat> so as shown on the wheel, as you can see on the wheel, it has beliefs. So generosity, spiritually centered, courage, respect, mutual sharing, beliefs, love, fortitude, hardworking, compassion, humility. So at the center of this tool is equality. So equality is recognized by that everyone has the right to follow their path. Equality means power sharing not holding power over. Equality is at the center of all healthy relationships. So with that, it's a natural life support power that is grounded spiritually and requires nonviolence and is based on character. So here we have gender-based violence can be the causation of MMIWR. These forms of violence are indicators that can lead to MMIWR cases, which is DV, IPV, sexual violence, sex trafficking, homicide, rape, femicide, and forced sterilization. So if I could get uh, some volunteers to um, go off mute and just talk about in your work as a provider or advocate, how do you, how when you have reflected on DV, IPV, and SV, can lead to a murdered or missing situation? That's the first question. The second question is, uh, did you know in the state of New Mexico, the majority of homicide cases perpetrated against Native women were at the hands of Native intimate partners? How does this awareness reframe your role as a provider or advocate? Hi, this is Kenneth Chavez, you know, host. Um, I got on late. Um, I am, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
So I, you know, have over 10 years experience in the sexual violence field. I am a lifetime advocate. And so a lot of what I see is, you know, um, um, the intimate partner violence, the domestic violence, sexual violence in our Pueblo communities is a lot different than what we see in um, the media nationally as, as far as missing and murdered indigenous women because of the different environmental issues that uh, cause this too as well. So for me, a lot of times that victims um, that I have spoken with, a lot of them are trying to avoid these issues in their home and then get you know, recruited by these different individuals in the um, sex trafficking field, whatever it is. And so, you know, they're getting, um, what is it, groomed to feel like this is a kind of life that they want to live, that they're getting money, they're getting attention. And so I feel a lot of us Native community members, um, sometimes we don't have that in our home. And all these different violences that are, you know, play a role in it. And so um, also really looking into our public communities as what is the type of sex trafficking, missing and murder women that goes into it, because, you know, a lot of families, you know, because of the pandemic, we're all going through some sort of trauma now. And so that gives, you know, a lot, a lot of leeway in it for trying to find money and trying to find health resources and stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, thinking of this, like, let's see in the chat. Sorry, I just saw this. So Rita Mart Martinez said, it seems like the focus right now, especially with the Violence Against Women Act, is on non-Native per perpetrators. And she said, which is due to lack of research in tribal communities versus urban Indian experiences. So when you think of that, like, you know, oh my gosh, um, there are more, there are more um, <clears throat> um, native male perpetrators. And like for the work you do, when you think of this, how does this awareness reframe your role as a provider or advocate? So from Preston on the chat, it says, I have seen abusers exploit a native survivor's substance use leading to worse violence. This information here, you know, it's how can we raise awareness? How can we, you know, bring up these conversations in our tribal communities because I know uh, a lot of different tribal communities are more patriarchal. So how can we as women or as, you know, advocates, uh, how can we bring this up? How can we educate our communities? So that's what I think. You know. Um, good morning. This is Trudy Sousey, and I work with um, Navajo Nation Division of Social Services Family Harmony Program, and I am the principal victim witness advocate for the program, and I manage a domestic violence shelter in Shiprock, and as an advocate and doing this work for over 18 years, the way I look at the miss, um, missing and murdered, the situation being a service provider, I recommend that we start with our clients. We educate our clients. The clients that reside in the shelter, we owe, my advocates and I always um, iterate the missing and murder. Like if you were to walk, if you were to hang around with the wrong crowd, if you were to be in the wrong places, anything could happen. There's people out there that will take you and you never know, we're not gonna see you again. So for us in our, in our program, we start from our clients. And I think that would be one way to start that awareness and that education in that field, because they are victims, you know, they are victims. 
and this um, missing and murder is has increased. So they could be a victim with that. And it's true, you know, they, they could it actually with the with their intimate partner it starts from there. So I wanted to share that with you that for us, it starts with our clients and their children, even the children that when they come in with their moms, we educate them as well and say, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. And it's really unsolved. And these missing and murder cases take from God two months to 10 years to, to get any kind of information done. So it's, it is a, a lot of patient and it's a long process. So I would just recommend that as an advocate, you know, I suggest we start educating our clients so they can educate their families. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Trudy. Yes, so uh, in my previous job, I was a, a drug service provider. I case manage victims and survivors of human trafficking. And I remember I had a client who you know, explain to me what her, her boyfriend would make her do, but she didn't realize she was being trafficked. So, you know, I had to explain to her what trafficking looks like, the signs, and, and she was just like blown away. And she was like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm being trafficked. And I said, yeah, and, and she didn't even think she was being trafficked by her boyfriend she thought it was like a survival survival tactic to bring in food um, to get money just you know just enough money to get a night off the streets like to get a motel or hotel and so yeah it's um you know it's important to keep educating and and being that strong advocate for the people we're helping. I'm gonna read off the chat. Let's see, Michelle Ben. She said the DB IPBSV is affecting our children. When our children grow up in this violent cycle, they have unlearned, they have learned a behavior that is unhealthy. Family in this families in this violence have minimized the toxic behavior and they are in denial. It is sad what they see. This is a way of life. It is around us every day and in, until our communities really address this within our government uh, leaders, then it will open up doors to set up local programs to assist our people. Law enforcement is so essential to start with the wheel to address this violence, but we don't have enough police officers and many cases are dropped and the victims become hopeless. Yes, so with this, like, uh, I'm from the Navajo Nation, so when I think of my community, uh, you know, Navajo Nation is like a huge, large population, and they don't have enough police officers. So it takes, I don't know, so many hours for a police officer to get on the scene, and, you know, like what Michelle Ben said, the victims then become hopeless. So I know that a lot of tribal communities are, are trying to develop more DV shelters. And for me, I'm hoping that they also develop shelters and safe houses for sex trafficking, human trafficking victims and survivors, because, you know, um, we don't have those in the tribal communities, but for the shelters we do have, you know, it's sometimes at full capacity. So where can we, um, where can we help our, our clientele or the people we're advocating for when we don't have the resources? Yes. Yeah. They don't realize they're being trafficked. Um, and not knowing their partner is abusive, period. Yes, that's from Preston. So I'm just reading off the chat. So Rita said, yes, people think trafficking is only when someone gets kidnapped. Yeah, so, you know, being in this work, I've heard that, you know, family members are <clears throat> the ones who traffic their relatives. 
and you know it's 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 a sad situation and and I think that we do really need to address that in our criminal system in our tribal government and you know it's just not domestic violence intimate partner violence you know it's trafficking and then it's you know homicide so it's everything and we just need to you know keep advocating and you know try to uh, build a better safer community for our relatives um let's see here kina chavez we can't rely on state feds even tribal programs because of sensitive boundary of uprising most times our community champs have to step up and commit to supporting and enforcing awareness yes and then albert mentioned many victims have lost trust in the criminal justice system within their tribe because of it and the offender knows nothing will happen to them yeah so everything yeah michelle ben i've seen cases in shiprock where grandpa and grandma traffic our grandkids to local business for alcohol and money it is in our communities and many farms. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really happy to know that you are all of aware, you are all aware of what's happening in our tribal communities. And you know, that's why we're here. That's why we're doing this work is to continue to fight and to protect our loved ones, our relatives, our, our communities. And, um, <clears throat> but I am happy you know, that all of you are doing this work and, and to continue to, to be that voice for those who don't, who can't use their voice. Um, so yeah, this is, um, we have a lot, a lot to do. And I hope that our tribal communities get more resources and shelters and safe houses you know to keep our loved ones safe this is from kina unfortunately sometimes our resources don't realize they are adding in another hurdle for the victim yes does anyone else want to share like the work you do and how you can see how these different violence um can lead into MMAW situations. So real quick, I uh, this is Kenda again. <laughs> um, so as like you were talking about, you know, working with victims and stuff, um, I was reading on the chat that a lot of um, that Deanna had mentioned that counseling helps a lot of their victims and education. Um, I did when I was working with victims up in Santa Fe with, um, I believe it was LifeLink. Um, we did do a lot of counseling they had you know um group sessions and stuff like that but for us i think a lot of it was you know that tangible um pieces of artwork you know letting them work with their hands and be more spiritual holistic healing i would say more and so i think um we don't realize that a lot of those holistic healings opened up those doors to that top therapy and so to, uh, I think we're um, in that time to where we need to think outside of the box on how are we going to help these individuals, you know, build up that strength positively, not focusing on negative things, just like we said, you know, education is good, but a lot of the times that education is going to change with over time, for instance, how we talk about, you know, stranger danger, um, how, you know, victims are being victimized by so-called strangers not you know people that they know and so a lot of this education not only needs to come from the programs you know we need to be community members that are stepping up and you know a lot of this is our future for our kids and for those future leaders that are speaking out and a lot and a lot of our future leaders aren't getting that support because we're feeling like, oh, maybe they're too young. They don't have that enough experience. But in all reality, you know, there's so many dynamics that come to this whole missing and murdered indigenous women, as well as, you know, the violence and, and sexual assault. And so for us community members who are really 
um, passionate about the work and wanting to make that change, you know, every little step step helps, you know, going out there and giving out what you know, your experiences, talking with those people and, you know, really making that your um, support, how finding out how you can support your community like that. And I think that's one of the goals that I'm doing right now is like, with all the hats that I played in my career, I, like I said, mentioned, there's some hurdles that we are bringing to these victims that we're trying to help. And so I'm trying to look at those little pieces and focus on that and see how I can connect with whatever programs and put two and two together. And so I think that's something that we all have to, you know, figure out and step away from this whole working with, you know, state and federal because of those jurisdictional issues, those boundaries that make it, you know, hard for them to, you know, fund certain things. Thank you. Yes. So I like that statement. It's it's up to us. You know, with MMIWR, it's always been a grass grassroot movement. You know, we're the ones who are at the front lines being advocates for our loved ones and you know as you see on social media you know we're the ones who are putting out the missing person flyers uh we're the ones that are developing um ways like search parties to find our loved ones to hold rallies and marches so, like, I just applaud, you know, all the advocates and direct service providers out there, you know, it's hard work and it's heavy, heavy work. You know, when I used to be a, a case manager and I would, victims would come off the street fleeing from their traffickers and pimps and you know for me I was always in that crisis mode um, crisis mentality like how am I going to get this person safe so I applaud all of you and proud of all of you for doing this work and um, just make sure you take care of yourselves you know it's important for us to take care of ourselves and so we can continue to be the best advocate and direct service provider for the people we're helping. So the most dangerous time for a survivor to leave is, oh, sorry, can't see this. When the most dangerous time for a survivor in a DV IPD situation. So it's when the survivor decides to leave. So the abusers repeatedly go to extreme to prevent the victim from leaving. So leaving an abuser is the most dangerous time for a victim of domestic violence. And then in the study, they found in interviews with men who have killed their wives that either um, made threats of separation by their partner or actual separations were most often the uh, event-led <clears throat> to the murder. So gun violence. Guns were introduced to Native Americans in the 1600s and adopted its use for hunting and protection. Gun violence against Native people have been taking place since colonization. Violence against Native women increased significantly and guns are one of the main forms of weapons among other women. Among all other women in the US, Native women are the second most likely to die from homicide of any kind. So this exacerbates the MMAWG crisis. So the likelihood of a woman being murdered increases by 500% when her partner owns a gun. <clears throat> For Native women, the lethal threat of a gun poses in the home of a DV IPV perpetrator is especially severe given that guns are involved in over uh, one third, approximately 35% of homicide against Native women. So with this quote, it's by Bell Hooks. 
<clears throat> she talks about the first act of violence that patriarchy demands of males is not violence toward women. Instead, patriarchy demands of all males that they engage in acts of <clears throat> psychic self-mutilation, that they kill off the emotional parts of themselves. The toxic masculinity, you know, comes from patriarchy. You know, when you hear like, oh, men, men are not supposed to cry or men don't, sh um, they don't show emotions because, you know, they want to portray this like macho um, type of person. But that really <clears throat> is the first act of violence on themselves because they're cutting off that emotional part of themselves. And that leads into violence. So, you know, it's important for us to support, you know, our family members by, you know, letting them know it's, it's okay to show emotions. And, you know, like this quote, it's the first act of violence and it demands males to be, um, to not be emotional. So I think that's the end of the presentation. Uh, so Jolene couldn't make it today, so that's why I took over uh, this morning to present on her behalf. But if you want to get a hold of her, her email is here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Renee Naiswoop, and I'm here to uh, give you the information regarding trans LGBTQ 101. Um, let's see here. So again, my name is Renee Swoop. at and so I will be presenting to you a trans LGBTQ 101. So you might be thinking, why is trans separated from the LGBTQ? So for that reason is because trans is not a sexual orientation. Uh, so I separate that because transgender is a gender identity. It's a working of the mind and it's not something you're sexually attracted to. Um, but some people are sexually attracted to trans people and that's trans identified people who um, are attracted to trans people. So I just separate the trans to kind of really give it its own, own meaning and purpose within the, the, the alphabet of the LGBTQ because uh, sometimes people tend to think it's, it's a sexual orientation and when it's not, again, it's, it's a gender identity, it's a working of the mind. Uh, so you may ask, why am I here? Who am I and why am I doing this kind of presentation? So. I have lived a life of pervasive discrimination, incarceration, um, sexual assault, um, uh, incarceration in a male facility, um, discrimination when it comes to employment or um, buying clothes, um, basic, uh, just, just any other um, forms of discrimination I've, I've dealt with and I've continued to deal with today. Um, I've also survived um, near-death experiences. I've had knives to my throat, guns to my head, um, shot at, chased, um, nearly beaten. Um, and so with, with those, those very particular experiences, it gives me great honor and privilege to provide the trans LGBTQ 101 because I'm able to provide real life experiences that you yourself can, um, it can be a very eye-opening to certain things, especially when it comes to statistics, because uh, we do live in a world of statistics and we believe in statistics and we want statistics and we need numbers to um, apply for grants to be able to get the money to, um, to provide services to underserved communities. Um, and when it comes to the LGBTQ community, we are certainly under underserved or not even served at all. Uh, and when there's and there, and the services that are available to us, um, they're really inadequate. Um, and so trainings like this provide you as service, for, service providers, as well as frontline workers, the adequate services that we as transgender people, as well as LGBTQ people des deserve and we need. Uh, so hopefully with this training, you'll, it'll be a life-changing perhaps, uh, maybe a mind-changing. Um, it'll also give you an opportunity to better serve us as people. Uh, and not just as them or other. Um, you'll see us as people because we do live and we do survive. Um, and so again, hopefully this will give you an eye opener. Or, or actually, it will be an eye opener for you. Uh, so overview, so, 
so this training is it, it comes is very Western um, conceptualized because uh, again we do live in a Western society. We we've, we've been we've been built to think Western. Um, we've been think we've been built to think and only process in English. Um, although some of us do um, have second languages, third language, or fourth languages, but the 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 culture behind that. Uh, especially when it comes to indigenous people um, are, are slowly being erased. Uh, and with that, um, hopefully within this presentation, you'll get a, 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 a general idea when it comes to indigenous people and how the LG, trans LGBTQ people are being erased from our own people, from our own cultures, from our own tradition and from our own oral, um, oral history. Uh, so Again, this is the, a, a, a general overview of what I'll go through. Um, and again, if there are any questions that you have, please do not hesitate to put it in the, in the um, chat box or um, stop and say, you know, I have a question um, or I believe you're able to uh, raise your hand within the, the, the Zoom, Zoom presentation app. Uh, so again, do not hesitate to ask questions because this is a safe place for you to ask those very un very uncomfortable questions that you've had boiling in the back of your head. Uh, and so I, I'm a resource person as well. Uh, I'm, I'm here to educate you and make you feel comfortable in asking these questions. So again, do not hesitate to stop and ask questions because it is, it is our human nature to be curious and to want to know. Um, and we cannot fight that. We cannot put that in the back burner. So again, ask questions and please ask questions. Uh, so again, with this, with this particular training, uh, the very resources that are supposed to help us as people, as trans LGBTQ people, uh, the, are the very resources that don't help us because of many of things. Um, it could be the, um, our, um, our, our biases toward uh, women, toward trans people, towards um, lesbians, towards bisexual people, toward gay people, um, or gay as a whole. Um, it, 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 ten, it, it really cuts or limits our, your, your want to help um, certain people. And so we have to look at ourselves and check ourselves when we say, oh, um, I don't understand you, so therefore I can't help you. Um, but again, you are the resource people and you are supposed to help everyone. Um, there is no, there, there is no need to deny people from accessing services. Um, although when it comes to the, the trans LGBTQ people, even specifically trans people, the services that are supposed to help us always deny us. And with that very one, very, very one experience, bad experience, word travels within our community like wildfires. Um, and we say, oh, that, that one organization is no good, doesn't treat me, but it, I was treated badly, so don't go there. It only takes one, one experience to put your organization on a bad list. Uh, so again, um, we are people, we are in need of help and you are the services that should be helping us and we need for you to help us. And so trainings like this are very important for you to take so you have a better, better understanding of who we are as, um, as a community. And so I like to jump into um, traditional, um, a traditional history really quick, just because this definitely focuses, this, this workshop definitely focuses on indigenous and gender-based violence. And so I like to jump back to um, traditional way back in the day, um, um, our, our, our ancestors. And so this is a list of some, some tribes in the United States that still have some, some labels in their, in their native language. Um, and if you and if you take a closer look, you'll see that the family of the female trans trans men. Um, so this is basically so. So the trans the, the female body is trans women. The female body is trans men. So if you take a look at the trans trans men, you see that very very some are very uh, some are disappearing. Like with Navajo, Navajo does not have a a label, but there there is a label out there now. It's, the DILPA, but that's not for certain. That was just basically um, Dr. Wellesley Thomas um, doing his research, and he came about that came about that particular particular um, label for trans men. But because of colonization, women and children were first to go, along with um, trans men, because women were seen as the the weak part, weak the weak ones, and so they were eradicated first or tried to eradicate first. 
Um, and so you see in this, in this diagram that trans men, um, their labels are slowly disappearing. And so with, with, any, with any presentation that I do and all presentations that I do, I always like to honor um, my fallen sisters as well as our historical sisters and brothers. Uh, because stories of these historical historical people have been told that they've died in a very horrific and tragic way. But today, when you look at our trans women who are who are dying or who are being killed, they're they're being killed horrifically and and tragically and very heinously because you hear so so every year every year let me, let me do a quick jump um, into today so every year we we celebrate on november 20th the trans day of remembrance and so that is a day that is set aside one day that is set aside for to honor those who have died because of um trans misogyny people who kill trans people um for ignorance because they're ignorant because they don't like trans people because they don't understand people but one of the, one of the most important things that comes from that data and that information is the fact that trans women are dying at the hands of their lovers their partners because the, the, because their male partner was outed put out there they're not that everyone knows that they're dating a trans woman that they're trans trans attracted and so that particular partner goes and kills their lover the trans woman in a very heinous way they're burnt they're they're um chopped up they're beaten and found in ditches trash cans they're slaughtered um and again the, again trans women are being killed very heinously just because of their trans identity and so that's something you should take into consideration versus our historical sisters and brothers who their stories are being told in two different ways. Um, for the most part, you'll always hear that, oh, they died because um, they were gay or they were lesbian, which is really not true and oftentimes. Like with Weiwei here, who is of the Zuni tribe, the Zuni Pueblo, you hear that she was killed. I, I, I first heard that she was killed um, because um, the, the US Army found out that she was, um, she was a man. But that, that is not true. She basically died of health reasons. She died naturally. Um, and that's something you don't, you don't hear often. Um, and so Weiwo was someone who was very important to tribal people because she went and she um, went to Washington, D.C. and represented her tribe as um, an ambassador for the Zuni people. Um, when President um, Cleveland was, was um, in office, we also hear um, a steam claw um, didn't die heinously or didn't die um, in any way bad, but he was more recognized for his um, weaving uh, and was believed to be intersex. Uh, and but he he also brought controversy within the Navajo people because he was also a medicine man who did um, stamp painting, but he also understood that colonization was happening and that that his that the PR people, the Navajo people would change. Um, and so he started weaving some of the stem paintings um, into uh, rugs, which brought a major controversy within our Navajo people. Um, but he was also um, one of the co, what do you got the co, um, yeah, he helped build the, the Wheelwright Museum. Uh, and so he, and some of his, his, his rugs are hanging there. Um, again, he was also known to perceive, I believe, intersect. So he had both male and female um, genitalia, which was ambiguous. Um, and so in Navajo, I've been told that when it comes to those certain type of people, the intersect people, they're protected by the thun by, um, thunder, uh, thunder. And so if you in any way, in any form, in any shape or way, harm or or dis um, disrespect um, the intersect people or the necklace, then you were struck by lightning. And so it was really a, a major honor to be to be such. And, and our Navajo people did see that. Because of colonization and Christianity, um, some of those stories are being erased, especially within our, our emergent stories, where um, the, the separation of sexes and how the the third and fourth or fourth and fifth genders were the ones who helped bring the people back together again. Because again, the basis of human of human nature is for us to recreate. 
uh, and the, the Nakalais understood that. Uh, and so they brought men and women back together and that's how the Nakalais tend to, were able to survive. Um, so that's the story, quick story behind it. Um, Astina Clay and Astina Clay and our origin story. And so Pine Leaf was very interesting too, uh, who was a woman um, and also was seen as a man. But for this particular one, I, I've heard that her his own sibling his own siblings were the one who killed him because they found out that she still had her genital her her female genitalia um but the most important part of her of their story is the fact that they were a chief a woman chief that rose high ranks and not in not, not any woman was able to do that um she also or they also had multiple wives um and led parties into the late 40s. Uh, so a very important person for the uh, the Crow, the Crow, um, Crow people. So that's just some some example of our historical sisters and brothers. Um, there are many more. Um, and so again, some have been erased from oral history as well as from um, our traditional, traditional stories. Uh, so these are some of the most important ones that I believe is, is good to share because the stories are very different when told by someone who hasn't really done the research uh, versus some who, someone who has. Again, it goes back to that violence and how LGBT people are portrayed as uh, something else and therefore should die heinously, which in, in all cases, they're not really, that's really not the case. And so we see that we see, we've always um, seen this picture. I've seen this picture many of time and I always wondered why, um, but going back to the violence that has been portrayed and has um, bestowed upon us as LGBT people, the, um, white white scholars, white anthropologists came here and said, oh, those are other people. And so the first term that they used and, and described this as, as was as Burdash. So Burdash is a really negative term, a very offensive term, because when you take a look at that word itself, it, it's like, oh my God, what is that? Um, but this word it erases the T LGBTQ people. Uh, it began with that. Um, with colonization came Christianity and the forbiddance of homosexuality in tribes. Transvestism is not to be considered synonymous to Burdash, but the essence of Burdash lies not in the change of wardrobe, but rather in the publicity recognized institutional change in role and status. And so again, Burdash was a, a term that was uh, trans that is translated to kept boy, male prostitute, and kept for unnatural purposes. And so Burdash was a negative term. And this also this also was the reason for some changes that came came about in the um the the the, the term two spirit, which I'll let it go into. Um and again, Burdash was just a, a term that the white anthropologists labeled us as, and that was that was utilized um, to recognize us and to label us. But some people have gone and moved forward from that, and um, the two two spirit term was one that was that was coined um, to replace Burdash. And so a little bit of background when it comes to the um, trans LGBTQ community, um, it, uh, evidence shows that hate crimes against us. Um, are underreported, unreported, or not reported at all in the United States, and these are for many of reasons. Um, some victims do not report sexual violence because they don't want to be outed. Um, outed is a is a form is a way of telling someone else's story to someone else when you did when you did not get uh, that permission to do so. Um, fortunately, I'm, I'm a very out trans person, so you can say, oh, Renee identifies as trans, Renee is transgender, Renee identifies as trans woman, because everyone knows me as, as a trans, as trans woman, and I do publicly say that, and I say that because it's also a political statement for myself. It, it lets you know as someone who does identify as trans that we are still here, we are, we are evolving, we are, we are living, um, and that we are still here. Uh, oftentimes you see you'll see trans women, especially trans women of color on the streets, and that's just not something that they chose to do. It is it is it, it, it is with the fact that people don't want to hire trans people. I've been on the streets. I was homeless uh, as, as, a, as a college educated person uh, because people did not want to hire me. Um, that, that, that in itself can be uh, it, it is a complex complex um, 
complex reason to why I was not hired. It could be the fact that I was an addict, the fact that um, I was um, so an addict. I could be the fact that um, I could be I'm trans. It could be the fact that I'm six foot one when I wear heels and I'm very out about my trans my transness. Um, it could be many of reasons, but the one the biggest reason that we're pushed to the streets is because we the we need to survive. We have to survive like anybody else, and so in order for us to survive, we we tend to look at and and do sex work, and that's the best form of us to survive. Because again, how else do we want to survive if if people are not wanting to hire us as trans people? And so. Hate crime is definitely um, a very complex um, issue in itself. Uh, sexual orientation and gender identity-based hate crimes may not be perceived as biased, motivated by responding officers because of their inexperience. And that's something that's very interesting because when you look at when you look at um, police re responding to a domestic violence and they see two gay men standing there, um, and their and their first thought is um, which one is the perpetrator and which one is the victim. Um, you see two very muscular men, and and so with that with that perception, they they don't believe that that is a domestic violence because we're 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 we're, we're trained to think okay, you have a perpetrator who is much bigger, who is stronger, who is able to control their victim, which is based, who is someone smaller and someone who is dainty and someone who doesn't seem like they're strong. Uh, so physically physically we're, we're trained to think that. Um, but that's not always the case when it comes to the trans LGBTQ community. There's, they always don't, they don't seem that it is a domestic violence because of what they've been trained to think. Um, and so oftentimes that's the reason why um, when it comes to reported um, crimes, especially when it comes to domestic violence within the trans LGBTQ community, it's either underreported, unreported, or we don't like to call police because we're always mistreated. And again, it goes back to that one experience. Uh, it only takes one bad experience for us not to go back to you. Uh, and this is the case with police officers, because police officers are some of the most people, some of the most. Um, how much was that? What's the right word that I'm trying to find? Are some of the people that choose to disrespect us and take advantage of us uh, because of the power that they have behind that badge. Um, when I was in, when I was incarcerated within the male, male facility, like I had no control of, of who I, who I am or who I was or, um, how to say no to officers, because if I said no to a correctional officer, then I would be insubordinate and I would be sent to segregation or to do the rest of my time. And I was told that when I first got to prison, um, that if I, if, if the war, if, so the warden, the lieutenant, the, 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 um, the captain, they all took me into their own office, their own office and told me, um, Gray, if we ever hear of you sucking Tom, Dick and Harry and whatever you people do, um, you'll do the rest of your time in segregation. And so that was, that stuck in my head. And oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it, it was, it was just raining. It was raining for me. Um, so I, I, I just kept to myself. I tried to keep to myself, but uh, it was it was more so to it was not so you would believe that the, that the correction officers are there to care and take care of you or to be the security to protect you from the the inmates. It was actually the other way around. Um, it was more so that I needed protection from the officers and not the inmates. The inmates are, took care of me, made sure that I was safe and sound, and made sure that I was living and I was, I was being taken care of in, in prison. Uh, versus uh, the correctional officers. I could be walking to the library and being told, okay, great, you step into the room and I would be told to strip down, um, strip down to just my boxers. And then they see that I have, uh, I have breasts and then they go, okay, you put your clip back on and they walk out. That was, that was, that happened so often that I didn't want to go outside the pod, but there were times I had to leave because uh, I did work in the in the kitchen, uh, so I was always forced to go every morning. Um, okay, any questions, anyone? Why I'm 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 because I'm looking at the uh, question uh, chat box right now. So I have any questions in the chat box? But um, Preston said it takes one bad experience to put your org on a bad list. So true. And he put in Detroit, we have several black trans women who were 
coerced into working with the cops to go undercover, but then the cops didn't protect them at all. Also mm -hmm. devastating. These women were brutally murdered. And Monique said, that is terrible pressing. Are there any articles we can read on this? Did it even get media coverage? It wouldn't surprise me if it didn't. And Preston put Shelly Herta and the article um, link. And Kevin yeah. said, many times police don't ask relationship don't ask the relationship and classify the incident as two roommates. Mm -hmm. Preston said, I'm sorry you have to go through all this, Renee. And Diane Sandoval Grego said, thank you for sharing. Barbara Derringer, thank you for sharing with us. You're so strong and beautiful. Marquita, thank you for being here to share your stories. And Rita, thank you for your bravery and sharing your stories. Also awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I have a I have a question. Can you sure. hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hi, Renee. Uh, I'm Preston. I'm also trans. So it's really nice to have you have you here. Um, so my question is kind of throughout all this, what are some of the ways that like your spiritual practice helped keep you sane um, and like helped make you feel um, I don't know, supported and grounded still. I I honestly don't, I don't have like a actual um, self-care that I use and, and I should. Uh, before, before I used to do a lot of meditation. I used to do a lot of um, self-care in regards to, I deserve to do, I deserve to have time for myself. I deserve to do certain things to really, to take care of myself. Um, and I, I've learned that telling my story and doing presentation like this is also self-care because it allows me to kind of take some of that weight off my shoulder and share my story. But most importantly, the fact that my story enlightens everyone to want to make that change. Um, and so it is very, I always, I always stress to organizations and any, any, anyone who is wanting any trans or LGBTQ training to have a trans or LGBTQ person present the stories, present the presentation, because if, if, if you're not, if you don't, if you've not had that trans LGBTQ experience, then you presenting the very important information like this, you're missing the most important, most important part of a training, the experience, the real life experience. Uh, so I, 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 per, I personally believe that me doing these type of training is, is self care is also self healing. Uh, because for a number of years, I, I always asked the question, how does healing look like? What does healing look like for me as a trans person when I'm, I don't have the opportunity or I, I don't have the time because I was, I was in that survival mode of wanting to, needing to provide for myself for the next couple of hours, for the next night. Like I didn't, I, someone who's living on the streets and who is trying to make it, make life, make it through life on the streets without a job and, and forced to have to pull tricks to survive and live. Like you don't have the time to go to a, a therapist to talk about your problems and issues. The fact that, you know what, I was raped. You know what, I was gang raped. You know what, I was, I was told to do this. You know, I, there's, there's, there's no time for that because we're pushed and we're forced to survive and do sex work. Um, and so I honestly believe when someone is pushed to that brink of constantly living in that survival mode, we detach from our true selves. Um, and I saw myself doing that because I, 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 I've, caught, I've caught myself doing these things that I would never do in my, in my right mind. Um, and so drugs and alcohol certainly pushed me to that brink. Um, and so I say that living in a survival mode is a very scary place for some people. Uh, some don't, don't, don't see it, others do, um, and they recognize that. But I think it's, it's very easy to, to lose yourself in that survival mode. Um, so again, I, I believe, I truly believe that me telling these pre 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 types of presentation as well as telling my story is healing for me. That's a long question. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> I hope that, an that helped, um, answered your question, Preston. And thank you for your question. Okay. All right. So let's see here. Yeah, quick, quick background again. Um, again, uh, Trans LG people are, are fear. They fear police because, like some of the stories that you, um, some of the information that you saw in the chat, we're taken advantage of. We're, we're coerced to do certain things that we want. We don't want to do, um, and sometimes we are we are killed at the hands of those who are um, who are supposed to serve and protect us. 
Um, so yeah, very, very, very complex and very, uh, very complex and but very true when it comes to transgender people. Um, and so again, it's, it's very important to listen and hear um, to trans people, especially when they're talking about their, their cr the crimes that have been have been done to them. Um, and you'll you'll hear the resilience behind those stories because we are still here. And that's something that's very important when it comes to trans people is that the resilience that we have, we're able to overcome, we're able to survive. And look, we're, we're still here, even though colonization um, and Christianity tried to erase us and we are still here, we're still telling our stories. And I honestly believe, and this may, this may seem um, way out there for some people, but I, I, I truly and honestly believe that trans people, men and women, um, are going to save us, save the world because of the, the thinking that we have, the duality that we have, the, we can switch back and forth between male and female thinking. We're able to understand a lot more than just someone who has um, a mindset that was created and built in a Western, Western schooling. Like we can look beyond that. And so I honestly believe that trans people are going to be the ones who save the world. That's just my, that's just my thought, my opinion. Uh, so then domestic violence. So again, domestic violence, again, we're not, it's not, it's not seen as domestic violence. It's seen as roommate or someone or um, it's seen other, other, otherwise, uh, other than that. Um, so you, you'll see that the information here is really, it, it's, it's, it's scary because when you look at domestic violence within the trans LGBTQ community, it's much higher than general population. Um, but you don't see that when you don't see that in data because again, it's, they're not they're not reported, they're underreported or unreported, um, and they're reported as something else, uh, roommate fight, a fight between roommates, um, and the abuse exp experienced by us can be equal or more damaging. Um, psychological violence can be really scary within the trans LGBT community because we could be outed, um, and outed is a is a fearful tactic that is that is utilized and used toward trans LGBT people who are not out, especially when it comes to their employer uh, and their family. The, the, the fact that you possibly lose your job, become homeless um, and lose your family as well. Those are the some of those horrific, scary things I, I think I would be very afraid of to lose. Um, but, and I think, I, think that's, I, believe, I believe that's one thing, the reason why I tend to be very out on my transness uh, is because I, I, I know that there are stories behind some people who, who weren't out um, and have lost their, lost their jobs and lost their families. Um, and it's, just, it's, it's very frightening to hear that, very scary. Um, but I hope that me, again, me doing this kind of presentation will kind of help alleviate those stress, some of those stressors for some people who are not out um, and, and, and hopefully their employers or their bosses are attending presentations like this and they have a better understanding of what it is to be trans or who, or how, how, what it is to be lesbian, gay or bisexual. Um, because sometimes people react without, without not knowing the actual truth behind trans or LGBTQ people and how far we had to go just to get to where we are today. Because when it comes to trans and LGBT people, oftentimes we have to negotiate our identities when it comes when we want to attend places where other people are. People don't have to navigate through a system where we have to say, okay, do I want to become as a do I want to come as a trans person or I just, I just want to come as a person that have to that has to hide my identity because of the fact that some person is going to see me and say, oh you're trans, I didn't know you're trans, and then go and tell my boss and say, oh, this person is trans and she does this in order to do that, or, or he does that, and, and the possibility of losing job. Uh, so often that's one privilege that some people, a lot of cisgender people who have, but don't understand the fact that trans people, trans women, we have to negotiate our identity, or lesbian, gay, bisexual, we have to negotiate what they want to bring to the table. And so as service providers, you want us to be in attendance as a as our whole authentic self, because you can't just help just one part of us, because of the other identities I have to put away, and, and you can't see that. So you have to ask your 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 clients or your participants to come as their authentic self, because you want to help someone as a whole and not just part of them. Um, so again, that's something that a lot of people tend to overlook. 
Uh, and that's, that's one of the title in the, or that's the title in our workshop here, the intersections. So intersectionality is very important and for you to work from an intersectional perspective because we all carry multiple identities. Uh, we're college educated, we have a high school degree, we have um, a job, we're aunties, we're uncles, we're brothers and sisters. Those are some of the examples of identities that we carry. Um, and so you have to look beyond that as well when you're working with the trans LGBT community uh, because we all carry multiple multiple identities. And so our labels today, so we jump from um, the background to our labels and these are some of the labels that we see today. And so on our on the left hand side, you'll see fag, tranny, female, lesbian. Those are those are very negative terms. Um, and it, it's they're, they're really they're really horrible. Um, and growing up and having to hear this constantly on a every on a daily basis, you, you what the heck? I've grown to to really like you know what I don't give a care fuck that shit. You can you can keep that you're the one with the problem, not me. Um, to okay, let's, let's take this outside, let's go, let's go, let's go fight. So it 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 it, it can go either way, um, but. It's it's just it's it's just a bad term not to use um, because when you look at the word fag faggot it, it's it's been it's historically been used to label us as horrible people because of the 13th century this is this word actually goes all the way back to the 13th century um, when people who were who were seen as homosexuals or who were seen as gay they were gathered and then they were burned in the middle of the middle of the middle of the village. Um, and just because they were seen as seen as gay, as seen as homosexual, and so again, looking at fag and at the long history of violence that is attached to it, and so I believe today when that word is used or when it's thrown at me, it's a form of violence, because you are basically telling me that the history that it has attached to, you are wanting to do the same that same thing to me, and your your, your thoughts and your mindset is still at that point. Uh, so again, I believe using that term is an act of violence, um, and it's it, I believe it's a hate crime too as well, because of the, of the long history of violence that is attached to it. Um, but tranny, female, those are also terms that are more more geared toward trans women of color. Um, again, we are we are forced onto the streets. We're forced into sex work. We're forced into prostitution. We're forced into um, other forms of way to survive and pornography is one of them so tranny you often see in pornography as well as shemale uh so you'll see shemale and, and tranny as part of the labels within pornography so yeah so bad term not to use um androgynous queer by gender butch are some other terms uh gay two-spirit drag queen cross-dresser sissy are also another term and also one other term that i'd like to bring up um, is transsexual transsexual is actually actually a term medically coined for a trans woman who was a soldier and who wanted to um, transition into a woman um and so it so for medical purposes, that term was coined and used for, uh, I believe her name was Jen, Jen Jenny. Um, she was a, a soldier from 1950s uh, and, she need, and she wanted, and she felt that like she was not in the right mind, not the right body. And so she wanted to have the surgery. And so in order for her to have the surgery, they had to label it. And this is, this is Western, Western ideas, Western thought. In order for her to have the surgery, they labeled her as transsexual and then the, and the surgery was performed. Uh, so again, transsexual was a term medically coined for the purpose for um, a trans woman to want to transition um, surgically. Um, today, we've, we've, we've grown from that. We use gender confirming surgery, gender confirm, conform, confirming. We use all of these terms. Uh, so we we're definitely moving to a better place. Uh, a better, healthier, and more positive place versus oh now we have to we, from a from a place where transsexual was used to just in order for you to be able to transition today you can uh, I do believe Medicare um, is able to cover some gender affirming surgeries uh, and so we've definitely gone we've definitely come a long ways um, trans women are able to access um, some adequate health care but it's very it's very very limited and where those are at 
Um, unfortunately, we have one here in Gallup, Dr. Wei. Uh, she's an awesome doctor, and a lot of trans women do go to her from all over Navajo Reservation just to see her because she's an awesome doctor. And it was, it was like 20 years where I was teaching my doctors how to care for me. Um, but yeah, yeah. So we definitely got, we definitely come a long ways, uh, especially when it comes to our labels. Uh, transgender, uh, so you, you do see a multiple um, labels um, that fall under the transgender umbrella. And two-spirit also falls under there because, again, two-spirit can be seen as someone who, ha who has that dual uh, mentality, men male and female. Um, but oftentimes you'll see two-spirit as someone who is uh, who identifies as non-binary, someone who lives outside the gender binary, male, female. Uh, so you'll see two-spirit either under transgender or just as a um, general term for someone who is native and LGBTQ. Uh, so it's a, it's a very general term, depending on how the person wants to utilize it. And so again, this is much more of a, of a, of a native indigenous term that can be used to identify themselves. And so again, we're defining domestic violence. And this, really, this, this is an, uh, a page that really just this informs you that there's, there's no difference in how the violence is perpetrated or portrayed within the trans LGBT community because violence is violence toward anyone. Um, just because we're trans doesn't mean that the violence is less than or different when it is, when, it, when, when, when I am, um, receiving the crime or the violence toward me is there's no difference there's no there's no difference in it so this is really what this 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 slide really portrays is the fact that there's no difference in in domestic violence that is um experienced within the trans lgbt community same here as well again same thing um physical verbal psychological economic abuse all the same within the trans lgbt community uh so we go review in questions, let's see here. Okay, Rita, those are amazing gifts that we can all celebrate and support. Michelle, yes, uh, honey, doing all that is also just so we can be included. Yes, uh, Deanna, that sounds exhausting. I give you so much credit for navigating your life the way you have many blessings to you. And that's that's actually something, um, the, one, of the, one of the other reasons I, I do presentations like this is because Majority of the of the bad or the lived experiences that I've I've lived through and experienced and continue to live through and survive, I did it all alone. Majority of it I did alone. So I hope these presentations like this will give hope and and help people help, and want to make other people help trans and LGBTQ people to to get them the help that they need. Um, and there is help out there. Uh, and someone should not be going through any of these experiences on their own um because again we, we we are out there we have experienced a lot and no one should be and no one's not alone uh like that goes for anything any any issues like suicide ideations you're not alone there's other people out there to help you um trans misogyny you're not alone we can help we can combat that we can do education like this to combat that so again you're you're not alone and so this is some of the most important thing one of the most important things i do these kind of type of presentations is to let those who are either trying to come to terms with their identity or trying to um, want to come out or are finding ways to come out or to feel comfortable with themselves to want to come out. I hope this presentation helps them to kind of, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to come out and I'm say, you know what, I'm gay, I'm lesbian, I'm bisexual, I'm transgender. Um, and hopefully they know that they're not alone. There, there, there are resources and there are help out there to make you feel better and make you want to change and make you want to live your authentic self because living behind a, uh, a facade is, is not healthy for anyone. Uh, and so I'm, I just hope that me being a very out trans woman, trans person will help those um, believe in themselves to want to be their true authentic selves. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, Deanna. Uh, Christine, we all carry multiple identities. We sure do, of course. Um, Again, any identity is, is are all important. Just know that to be to be cared for or to receive the adequate service that you need, come as your true self, authentic self. Be truthful to yourself as well as to those who are providing the services. Uh, yes, Renee, I could agree. I could agree more. Using the F word is the same as someone using the N word. That is very true. I, those words, I, it's yeah. It, when I when I hear those words, it, it I cringe. Um, and 
it is it is something that I'm, I'm still trying to get used to. Um, I, I I thought I was as as a forty year, almost forty one year old person. I thought I had overcome the fear of that word and how much it has controlled me as a child, made me feel powerless. Even as a 41-year-old person, I still sometimes I do, I do still feel powerless when it is being thrown at me. Um, I, I, I kind of shrug and I kind of like want to cry. And of all the times I've done these kind of presentations, I've, I, I've cried once and I was doing a presentation with Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. I like it, it came out of nowhere, um, but it was one of the some. It also made it made me remember that you know what I still have work to do on myself. I still have a lot more to do in order for me to get to where I want to be, uh, and that goes back to being as a trans person, as someone who's transitioning. Um, you'll see that within trans community, and you said in trans, you always hear transition. I I, I believe that trans the the, the transition is a constant, a constant, constant thing that will be happening with trans people. And even just with anyone, um, if you're wanting to become someone better, you're transitioning to want to become that better person. So as a trans person, I believe that transitioning is a, a holistic process and it's be a lifetime process because we want to become someone better. Every, we, want, we want to become someone better than we were yesterday. Um, and so I honestly believe that transition as a trans person is going to be a constant, a constant, constant change um and so yeah it, it it's the word is sounds like it, it, i thought i was over but i guess I, I i'm not and so me having to undo relearn and better better understand um uh, from a different point of view at a different later at, at a later age in life because again i'm 41 years old and so as a child i, I heard this all the time and so i really did not have that knowledge behind that as of today right now i have a lot of knowledge regarding that word and so i have to recreate a better a better um fighting mechanism to combat that word so i'm not being taken down and being being come helpless again like like i was as a child so again it is a constant constant holistic process change for trans people and just for anyone as a whole uh todd thank you for your expressive informative and amazing presentation heartfelt thank you todd uh Christara, do you have any advice for working with youth who are transgender or navigating the process of coming out i i certainly do yes um you um i'll have my email at the very end unfortunately i did not um add youth to my presentation because with the youth is it i believe they're a very particular and very important um population that are constantly un underrepresented um but the, they themselves have a voice of their own if they if they want something they'll fight for it they'll go for it they're 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 the one who are pushing us as older people to constantly make changes within ourselves especially when it comes to labels uh so i do believe that the, the youth are very powerful in their in their own presence um but again when it comes to presentations like mine we tend to leave them out uh just because um they're constantly changing themselves because they know what they want and they know how to get it and if they don't get it then they're going to keep on trying and get it uh they're they're they are a force um so they're making us do changes within ourselves um but that's not to say that they're not uh, an important person they're not an important population to recognize um i just unfortunately didn't add them to this presentation um which is something i i always forget um, because my mindset is more so of, of my my personal my personal experience like this, like this experiences um, and my my work with the youth hasn't really been that expensive i've had very little uh, work experience when it comes to youth um, i did work um, at a um, casa Q for a little bit there and again they, they again they had their they had they they knew what they want they know what they wanted and if they didn't get it then they'll fight for it um so they're they're forced they're a force of their own um but again I, I i don't i don't have i don't have them incorporated in this presentation um but it's something i would i would need to do i need to do um uh, and that's just my 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 bad my my bad there uh, but i do have i do have resources on them though um if you i'll give you my, my email at the very end of this presentation for you to email me and i can certainly share those resources with you 
Logan, how do you feel about members of the community who are trying to take back the F word and use it in a positive way? I have friends who are members of the community and actively choose choose to use that word in their own language. It, it, it's, it's, it's very controversial. Um, people are do, doing that to, to get empowered um, and to take back that, that, that powerless feeling that they have when it was being used as, their, as a child, as I was saying before. Like queer, like people are using that or are, are taking that back and owning it. Like, you know what, My, I identify as queer, but again, now we're having to learn to use that as part of a label for people who identify as queer. For example, um, if you say, oh, they're queer, versus, oh, they identify as queer. So you don't want to use it as an accusatory way, like, oh, they're queer. Like that, that kind of, that sounds bad. Um, so we have, to, we have to teach ourselves to use it in a way that's very affirming and very polite and very um, respective. Oh, Renee identifies as queer versus, oh, Den uh, Renee is queer. You, you, you'll, see that, you'll hear the difference between both, both ways that are, are used. Um, so I, 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 I don't know about the F word. I, 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 I can't see that as a term that can be taken back and used and, and, and to be empowered by. Um, it's something that I would have to think more on um, because I, 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 I'm getting a, a thought about it in music. I think music will be, it is a powerful tool. Um, and again, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm have to, I'm gonna have to sit with myself and think, think that through more, more, more and more. Um, because because I am seeing both ways now as I'm, as I'm, as I'm thinking about it more and more. Uh, so I'll put that on hold, I'll put that on the back burner and I'll have to think about it more, give me some time. Um, yeah, that, that, is a very, that, that is a very interesting question that you brought up, um, Monique. Is it Monique? No, sorry, yeah, sorry, Logan. Uh, yeah, that's a, very, it's a very interesting question. I've never been asked that question before. I didn't realize that some people were also trying to bring that back. Um, but I do know that queer was is, is definitely being used and as a as a term. But uh, yes. When it gets responding to Logan. Okay. All right. So again, this is basically just um statistics because we do live in a scientific world where numbers do matter for a lot of purposes, especially when it comes to grant writing. Uh, and so I, I've actually I, I'm actually working with the trans equality right now and we are working on the u.s trans survey which will be coming out um in, in, in a few weeks actually um and it is the largest um trans survey that is available in the united states uh some change some important some important things that are changing with this year's um survey is that they've dropped the age age requirement from 18 to 16 so we'll, we'll be able to get a better idea of of the trans trans population uh and non-binary people uh, and most importantly, the fact that the within the the American and Alaska Native that there is going to be uh, a better way to self-identify um, because oftentimes when you see um, scientific surveys and you say, "Oh, I'm multiracial," you're you're if you say that you're multiracial, that you're 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 Native American, you're Navajo, you're Mexican, and you're white. Um, so typically, when when that happens, you don't your 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 Native American identity doesn't get counted as uh, as part of Native American identity. It's just it's just taken as a whole and put into other or multiracial. And so that the identity of you being a Native of being a Navajo, being a Native American, is not counted as as Native American. It's counted as multiracial. And so with this survey, we were able to create such a very very important, vital information when it comes to um, getting numbers for those who identify as multiracial. Um, and so I believe it's going gonna, it's gonna to definitely change some ways um, how surveys are taken when it comes to um, ethnicity uh, and, taking, and taking that into consideration. Um, so look out for that trend survey. Um, I, I do believe I have it in the in the book that, that everyone received. Hopefully, you did receive that and you printed it out on the very end. It'll give you a a, a breakdown of what the U.S. Trans Survey is. Um, and if you are not if you don't trans if you're not trans identified, please spread the word and put it out there to those who are trans identified who are non-binary and have them take the survey. Um, it'll be um, available online um, or take the pledge. So hopefully, you're able to spread the word. 
Um, and it, it is it, it will be a very important um, tool for any organizations who are going to be providing services to uh, the trans trans community community. Um, it allow you to build better policies and procedures for your for your organization to better serve the trans community. Uh, so again, look out for that. It'll be coming out in, in a few weeks. So domestic violence doesn't discriminate. It certainly does. Um, it is. It, it, it's no different when a cisgender person um, uh, is experiencing domestic violence versus someone who is trans or LGBTQ. It's, there's no difference. It doesn't discriminate. This domestic violence is domestic violence. We just have to unlearn the fact that uh, the one who's perpetrating the violence is is huge, is is very muscular, or very is bigger than the the victim who is small and dainty. We have to erase that from our our, 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 our perception of what domestic violence looks like or anything when it comes to the hetero, heteronormative thinking. So issues that impact the uh, native two-spirit LGBTQ community, um, individuals and community. So these are some of the, these are some, some issues that do impact us. Um, and I certainly do believe they, they go hand in hand, um, if, not, if not all um because we are trying to deal with a lot of a lot of a lot of issues all at once um and oftentimes we do rely on alcohol and drugs to kind of combat that and to numb the fact that you know what I, i'm losing i'm losing my identity i'm losing my culture um i'm dealing with rejection my family my friends are rejecting me I have mental health issues, I'm depressed, I have su suicidal ideations. Oh my gosh, I was discriminated against at the gas station because they didn't because I was native and I was Navajo. I am six foot one trans woman. They don't want to sell me alcohol uh, for whatever reason. Um, the fact that I'm a sex worker and I might possibly have HIV, uh, unemployed, and now I have to do sex work, like all of these are go go hand in hand. Um, and and oftentimes again, when it comes to wanting to access um therapeutic services, we, we, we were unable to do it because we were trying to survive. Uh, so this is some examples of what we're dealing with on a daily day, day to day basis or even in our lives or just dealing with it all at once. So we, um, the presentation from this morning talked about the gender binary and this is basically what this is, um, a breakdown of the gender binary. So we see male and female. So when a mother has a has has a child, has a baby, the first thing the doctor says, oh, steps on the butt, oh, it's a boy or girl. Uh, and so that that term itself is your um, sex assigned at birth. So basically, the doctor is saying that you're a boy or a girl based on your genitalia. Um, and so from that very point on, you're automatically put in a box. And then assess family. Oh, what? Oh, what did you have? Congratulations! Is it a boy or girl? Is the first thing we always ask. We never ask. Oh, how's the mother? Is the mother doing okay? Was the delivery okay? Was the was everything okay? Was there any, any problems or issues? Our always first question is: Is it a boy or girl? So we we're, we we think that we're automatically thinking that we we've been we've been trained to think that way. Again, going back to that doctor slapping the baby on the butt. Oh, it's a boy and a girl. From that very point on, you're already trained to be a boy or a girl. That's just a heteronormative thinking because heterosexuality is not, it's not the, the, what is it called? It's not normal. It's not, it's not, um, everyone's not heterosexual. It's just more common than, than, than homosexuality or being gay or being lesbian or being gay or being trans. Um, heterosexuality is just much more common than transgender or lesbian or gay or bisexual. Uh, so, when it comes to being put in the box, we're told, oh, you, can, you cannot choose between being a man or a woman or being a girl or a boy. You're basically a boy for the rest of your life. Or you're a girl, you're a female for the rest of your life. And so you're, you're trained to think and act like a boy and do, do male things, go play outside, play with boys' cars, um, being dirty and doing outside work versus a, a woman or female. You gotta be inside, you gotta clean the house, you gotta wash dishes, you gotta cook, you gotta always be prim and proper, you gotta have your hair done, wear a pink, pink bow. Um, and you're you're told these things, you're constantly and, you, and when you do something, anything outside of that, you're 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 slapped on the hand. You no, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to do that. Girls are not supposed to do that, women are not supposed to do that. Asaj you, you hear these things. Uh, so you you oh my gosh, 
And so when it comes to like, oh my gosh, I feel different. We feel, we feel afraid to tell family or friends, oh, I'm, I'm gay, I'm lesbian, I'm bisexual, I'm trans, because of the exact same things that we were trained to not do. Uh, and so when you act, when you act, when you're, when you're a boy and you act feminine, then you're told you're not supposed to do that. You, you're not, you're not, as like a boy, oh, that's just a boy thing when they're, when they're doing like these violent things. Oh, that's a boy thing. He'll get over it. He'll, he'll, he'll outgrow it. And when females act like a tomboy, oh, she'll outgrow it. She, I was a, I was a tomboy when I was a girl. I outgrew it. You hear these things. Again, we, those are things that were trained and that, that was, ingrained in us from the day we were born and so so we see here um we're told that we have to be attracted to women as men and we're attracted to be to men when we're, when we're female uh, so and we're also trained that male are given more privileges because of their of their strength because they're able to to fight more they're able to have that have the strength to do a lot more things versus a woman um, but I believe that strength and muscles don't mean anything because a dainty person can, can outdo someone who's very muscled. Muscles are just something that just you just you just create it because you're building you're you're picking up um, heavy things. Um, so that's just, that's just my thought. So again, this is a gender binary. It, it's 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 a heteronormative way of thinking because it was ingrained in us. We've been told from birth that. Um, you're straight. You're male. You need to be attracted to a female to be a woman. You have to be in your in your train, and you have to have children. Uh, so, this is the binary. Again, the gender spectrum. So we've seen sex refers to the biological status of male, female, or intersex, which is the sixth assigned at birth. Gender, uh, the societal construction we assign that is assigned by a doctor or someone, and we're told male, female. Um, when you hear gender stereotypes, they're referring to the ways we expect men, boys, and girls. Again, that's just gender, 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 um, gender stereotypes that female are supposed to be inside doing dishes, but which is not. Uh, male go outside and chop wood, um, do boy things outside. Gender expression is someone is how you want the world to see you. So as a trans woman, I like to be very feminine. I like to dress up as 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 feminine as I can. Have my hair done, makeup feminine clothes, um, that's just my gender expression. Sexual orientation um, describes an individual's attraction, and this can be spiritually, mentally, physically um, attraction to someone. Um, so there are three distinct components of sexual orientation, identity, behavior, and attraction. So sexual orientation is very important when it comes to um, medical, medical purposes, men who have sex with men. Uh, when someone who is who doesn't identify as gay or bisexual, that term is utilized for that purpose. Men who have sex with men, uh, so that's where the behavior comes from. And so, effects of, of phobias. Uh, we certainly know that um, phobia can be um, can always end in death. It can be violent. Um, it can be, be can be many of things. Uh, hate, uh, rape, uh, sort of loss of employment when somebody's been outed, loss of children, family. Uh, so phobias can can really disrupt and and destroy someone's life. So I do believe this is all in, in the in the booklet as well. So talking about intersections of identity uh, again, uh, working from from a very intersectional perspective uh, to be better service provider, you'll you'll be able to provide uh, someone the adequate services that we deserve and need. Uh, versus someone you're trying to help only partly, which you can't, which is you, you cannot do. Um, so when someone comes to you looking for support, it is crucial that you look at them as a whole, whole instead of isolating one aspect of them. Um, this will help. This will allow for a greater conversation and will help the person receive the support that they need. Uh, so again, we all carry multiple um, identities, um, and again, you want you want to help someone as a whole and not partly. So working from my from my intersectionality basis, um, it allows it, 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 it it's it was coined actually by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw to refer to the compounding impacts of simultaneously racial and gender discrimination and now widely applied within many social justice spaces. Intersectional theory gives language to the complex layers that make us each of us, uncovers where they intersect and high, highlights how we then experience the world as a result. 
So that's Kimberly Crenshaw's definition of intersectionality. And how can we implement a more inclusive and accurate um, view of identity? So these are some ways to um, take a look and see if your organization is inclusive or how we can do some make some changes within your within your organization um, so without it efforts to address injustice inequality and inequity will never fully meet the needs of the people impacted but how can we implement this more inclusive and accurate view of identity be intentional make a commitment to understanding what you're getting right and what you're getting wrong uh, and that's becoming being accountable for your mistakes. And if there, if you understand that there are mistakes, go back and change it. Uh, be holistic. Be give holistic attention. Always listen to trans people or LGBTQ, LGBTQ people because oftentimes we're not heard and we're seen as individual and invisible people. Uh, so listen to us, hear us, uh, collaborate and listen. Meet individuals at their intersections and be ready to respond with action. Meet someone where they're at, and that's that's very important. Meet meet where they're at. Uh, if you're working in a outreach um, outreach um, organization where you do outreach on the streets, always at, always meet them where they're at. Um, and I I was told um, through harm reduction training that it's best to ask um, not how are you doing, but how is it going. Because how are you doing? Uh, it, it it opens up a can of worm, um, and so so oftentimes not not oftentimes people who are asked that question are not are not um, have not have not really dealt with what they're dealing with right now. Uh, so opening asking how are you doing really opens a can of worms versus so what's what's going on. It, it allows them to be still be in the present um, and still allow them to get the service that they need and then can, and then go. And the very last one, very important, hold yourself and others accountable. Check in with yourself and, and on how your actions impact others and if you are being an ally and, and, and adjust as accordingly. Uh, we all deserve to have our voices heard, our experiences understood, and our unique needs addressed through relevant policies and culture change. And so when with that, with that very with that said, when, if you're if you're deciding to make some policy changes or um, anything um, any important changes that represents or that will be for the trans LGBT community, community have us at the table and have uh, have our experiences heard at your policy making change uh, meeting because oftentimes it's always men who are making decisions and creating policies for a community that they have no idea or have no experience with. That goes with women as well. Men are always making decisions and policy, creating policies for women, women's body, like right now with this um, abortion change, like men are making those changes for women. Um, so when it comes to policy changes, always have someone at the table who has the experience of, 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 of that policy change that you're wanting to create and um, allow to, 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 to evolve into your, to, to evolve into your, your organization. As for trans people, always have a trans person who has that trans has trans experience to help create those trans policies. Um, because again, someone who's cisgender who has no idea what it is to be trans are making those policies. You're leaving out some very important information when creating these policies. So this is this is going to be actually be an afternoon discussion on intake form and how to utilize the four tier questions. Uh, this is very important if you're wanting to be um, inclusive um, for with trans LGBTQ clients and survivors. So this will be an afternoon discussion, and I look forward to helping with this discussion at this afternoon, uh, which will be fun. I, I believe it will be fun and very interesting, and it will be a, a very important learning experience for a lot of people. And how to be an awesome relative. Uh, these are some ways to be an awesome relative. Uh, be mindful of trans LGBTQ people in your office or waiting room. Make your make your make your organization inclusive. Rainbow flags always tend to help um, help um, lesbian, gay, bisexual people to feel comfortable in your office, uh, especially when it comes to pamphlets or information that you have there. Um, have it inclusive. Have trans have a trans a trans wall, an LGBTQ LGBTQ wall with information that are really important to the community. Um, those are some ways to make your your office inclusive. Um, single stall restrooms, universal restrooms. Uh, we all, we all, we all use the restroom. We all need the restroom. Um, but some people tend to police restrooms, especially when it comes to public spaces. People tend to want to police police those public spaces, gender spaces. 
Um, so if you have a single stall restroom um, in your office, just put a toilet, put up a toilet, um, and it'll, it'll make your, it'll make the situation for a trans person to use the restroom because when it comes to using the restroom, we as a trans community sometimes like to we we have to we hold our we hold we hold it until we get home because it's more comfortable doing it at home versus going to a gender space men and women restroom like oh my gosh what are they, what are they going to say if I go into their female restroom um, or what are, what are they going to say when when I go into a male restroom uh, I unfortunately go wherever I go um, and if I need to go if I need to go and there's a male there's there's nobody in the male restroom I'll still go there. Um, but that's that's just that's just me. I didn't know that it's gonna it, it, it could lead to violence. But you know what? I have to go. I need to go. Oftentimes, when when I do that, other women tend to follow me into the male restroom because you know what? The women's restroom is always long. For so it, it, it's always longer than the men's restroom. So I just I gotta go. I gotta go. Um, but that is taking me some time to get the nerve to do that. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's probably not the safest thing to do. But again. Yeah, when I do that, other women to tend tend to follow me um, into the men's restroom. I'll never deny a trans person or LGBTQ person service because of your own personal beliefs. And this, I hope that this training will uh, help you um, think about your own personal biases and say, "Oh, I, um, yeah, I, I, I was thinking something else." And hopefully, this this has kind of changed a lot of those personal beliefs that you guys you have, um, and help um, help make you want to change your personal beliefs. Um, and treat trans people with the courtesy and respect you would like to be treated with. Again, we all like we all deserve to be treated as human beings, um, and that doesn't that mean you have to tra treat trans persons for whatever reason bad uh, bad thought you have about toward trans people. We all deserve to be treated um, humanly. Be aware that trans people may have a name or other information on records that may be different from their appearance or name and pronouns. This will be a discussion afternoon with the intake form, as well as a, as well as a privilege um, exercise that we'll we'll talk about. Um, and so, and um, your first your first um, your first thought of um, LGBT people. Uh, there's also in the in the booklet that hopefully you guys all received. Uh, so it, it'll be there. Um, allyship, accomplice. I believe accomplice is a better term to utilize when describing someone who is trying to help a community that needs the voice. But the most important thing is that you as allies or accomplices, that you want to speak with a community and not for a community, especially if you, if you don't have that trans experience or that lesbian, gay, bisexual experience. Uh, you shouldn't be talking for us. You should be talking with us. Um, and the most important thing is listen, because oftentimes we feel invisible and excluded, and which is true on a daily basis, especially when it comes to policy making. Um, just know that our voices are as important. Our experiences are invisible and need to be heard. Our stories need to be heard, especially when it comes to trans experiences, um, trans violence, or and, all, and, and any any stories. Uh, it we are important. With that said. Our past crossed not by accident, but by purpose. And so I like to really inform you that, you know, practice self, practice self care, talk to yourself like you would to someone you love, take care of yourself, um, be mindful of, of, of how you're taking a lot of things. And if you feel that, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little tired right now, listen to your body, listen to yourself. Um, and so, you know what? I need to take a breather. I need to, I need to step away from all of this. Um, and it's, it's important to recognize that. Listen to yourself. Listen, listen to your body. Your body is telling you something, and you need to listen to your body. And that's something that you have to learn to do. Um, I, I, I had to learn to do that, and so I like to really listen to myself. If I know that I'm sick, there's something that's happening in my body. If I know that um, my body is, is is doing something different than it normally does, then obviously there's something wrong. There's something going on in my body. So you have to listen to your body, and that's taking self care. Uh, so hopefully you do, you take that and you listen to that, you listen to yourself and to your body. Um, and with that, I thank you. Uh, it was an honor and certainly a privilege uh, to present to you guys. And hopefully you've, you've got some very important and enlightening and mind-changing um, information that you can take back to your organization, take back to your community and and teach and, and share with, with other people. Um, 
And if there are any questions or anything that you want to tell me that you don't feel comfortable telling me in the chat box, you have my, so I created a new email because my other email was just, it, it, it was a lot. So this is more specifically just for my consulting, like my consulting email. So I'll have better access and immediate um, um, attention to those emails. So I created a new email address, transawarenessintoactions at gmail.com. Uh, so if there's any questions or anything that you want to share with me that you don't feel comfortable telling in the chat box, there you have my email. Um, and I do... I do tend to respond to emails rather quickly. Uh, so again, it was an honor and privilege to, to share space with you, virtual space. It was an honor to be here with you guys. Um, and so hopefully um, you'll share the information that you've, you've gained um, with other people. Uh, and yes, any questions? I, I'm here for a bit. You can also meet yourself if you like, if you feel better talking um, or if you feel better in a chat you can do that or if you feel better emailing you can email me again I'm, I'm i'm available as a resource person uh so i'm here for for that purpose uh you know, or if you're wanting personal advice for yourself i'm here as as that as well i'm here as a peer um as a colleague um i'm here <laughs> again thank you very much wow Good response, good replies. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you for wanting to gain this information and this knowledge. Can't thank you enough because um, you're also bettering yourself by coming to these types of trainings and wanting to learn. Um, uh, Renee, we have a question. Yeah. So it's from S. Bitsui. It says, what event changed your life to start speaking out? <clears throat> So the, 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 there was not a, a specific event. Um, so I started working at the UNM LGBTQ Research Center and my, and my very first day at working, um, I was told I need, to, I need to do a presentation for a group of 40 FBI agents. Um, and so that was my very first time ever doing such a, a, presenta a presentation, particularly an LGBTQ presentation. Um, I had no no knowledge, no experience under my belt doing presentation. Um, but after after that that presentation, I felt um, and I was pushed, and I was kind. Of, I wasn't forced, but I was pushed to to tell my story more. And so as I got my as I got out there more and told my story more and more and more, um, I felt that I needed to I needed to do this. Uh, because there were not too many people who were doing or who are doing these kind of these types of presentations, especially when it comes to um, native um, native LGBTQ people that they're, they're not doing this often. Um, uh, you always hear someone uh, who is non-native providing and giving important information for native trans LGBTQ people. Uh, so I felt that I needed to do that. So that was my that was the reason I started, or that was way I started doing presentations like this. And I've definitely grown a lot more. Uh, and I've done a lot of presentations for uh, tribal communities all across the nation. Uh, so I've gotten very comfortable in doing this. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's why I started doing this type of presentation. You're all very welcome. And again, it, it, it's, it was a privilege and honor to share my story and share experience and share space with you guys. Um, and I'm glad you guys all stayed and, um, and participated because you're also changing your life as well by gaining all this knowledge. Yes, it does, Michelle. Um, I certainly do have passion and, and, and oftentimes you'll hear that because I tend to, I tend to get all excited and I, I start to talk really fast when I have that. You'll know that I have that passion when I start doing that because I start going, I start talking with my hand a lot and I start to speak fast and then like, you'll see like this light burst out of me that, and I definitely do have a passion and making change. Um, for the L uh, for the trans LGBT community, specifically more uh, the trans community, uh, because even within within the trans LGBTQ community, there we are we are um, we do experience that lateral violence um, within our own community. Um, even with the, even with our own um, trans community, we do experience that trans that 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 violence. Um, it is it is there, and so it's, oftentimes I'm also teaching other trans people and LGBT people that, you know what, we are here, we are part of the community, we are surviving, we are going through all of this. 
and some people tend to oh wow i did not know that my belief was that you guys were just like sex and drug addicts and you guys are prostitutes and that's where you guys belong and so sometimes these presentations are very enlightening and 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 taking down those those brick walls that some people have learned to keep up when working with um trans people there's another question from tim yeah over over the phone or face to face how do you, how do we address transgender individuals what is their or your preference i believe i believe um in person uh just because from, from personal experience, oftentimes I, I'm, I'm heard as, or they, I'm always referred to as male, so I had to correct the person on the other end. Where I'm, 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 I go by, I use pronouns she and her, um, so if you can refer to me as, um, as such, that definitely um, working in person does alleviate a lot of that, uh, especially when, um, when we're going to do the intake um, discussion, intake form discussion. Using the four two question does alleviate a lot of those very un, very uncomfortable questions. Like say, for example, if a trans man were to come into your office and a medical office and they wanted a pap smear. Okay, you're, you're a male, but are you, you're here for a pap smear? Like, again, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go further further in, further into that in discussion this afternoon. So I'll leave it with that because it will allow you to, oh my gosh, what, what, like how do you deal with this? How do you deal with this? So again, imagine, imagine a trans man um, coming into a medical office and asking for a pap smear. Just keep that in your head and we'll talk about that this afternoon um and i'll i'll, I'll break down how the the four tier questions will alleviate having to ask very uncomfortable questions uh, and that's the most important reason for the intake forms that we'll talk about this afternoon as well as um your first thought your first impressions about lgbtq people hey, thank you so much renee thank you oh, yes it was great. It was great. Yes. And thank you for the um, your, your presentation earlier that kind of helped um, segue into the presentation because some of the things that you mentioned in the, your presentation, it, 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 it I, I, I kind of left out in my presentation, which will definitely had pushed us far beyond my time as well. Yeah. So thank you for that, for the, for the, for the information, because uh, oftentimes I tend to forget a lot of those very basics, basic information that needs to be that need to be put into the presentation. Uh, so again, uh, uh, I, I tend I, I do a lot of presentations and they tend to be a lot longer than usual. Uh, you can give me an hour and a half, I can go into three hours. And so it, it's a lot of information. And so it is very important. Uh, but again, thank you. Thank you for giving that part of the presentation because it did help me. It did help segue into my presentation. And I can't wait for the workshop. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. So we're going to go head into our lunch break. It'll be from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. So we have one hour. And then once we come back, we're going to go into a grounding exercise, uh, which will be held by our project assistant, Tatiana. So we're going to do a body scan, you know, wake up our bodies for the afternoon uh, presentation and workshop. And then after that, at 110, we're going to go into uh, Christine Means presentation, The Path of Violence, and then we're going to head into a 15-minute break, and then that's when we're going to start the workshop with Christine Means, Renee Gray, and I, um, and then after that, we're going to have another break, and then we're going to play some games, and this is a chance for y'all to uh, win some prizes, so yeah, thank you for staying on. Um, I know it's it feels like a long day so far, but enjoy lunch and I'll see everyone back at 1 p.m.